All right, let's get right to it. Letter 17. When was the last time uh, you heard a sermon preached on gluttony? If it's been a minute, uh, Screwtape says, yep, that's, uh, that's par for the course. He writes, my dear Wormwood, the contemptuous way in which you spoke of gluttony as a means of catching souls in your last letter only shows your ignorance. One of the great achievements of the last hundred years has been to deaden the human conscience on that subject so that by now you'll hardly find a sermon preached or a conscience troubled about it in the whole length and breadth of Europe. This has largely been affected by concentrating our efforts on gluttony of delicacy, not gluttony of excess. Aha! Okay, so right away we've got to write this down. This is important. When it comes to this topic of gluttony, Screwtape's going to say what most people think of this topic they think of this, gluttony of excess. When in fact, he's saying there's actually this other kind called gluttony of delicacy. Delicacy. Stand by. So he says, this is, this is okay. I mean, yeah, th th this works, and he'll get to this in a minute. But ah, the, the, the gluttony of delicacy. Now, he gives an example. What does he mean? He says, this is what you want. This is super helpful. Your patient's mother, as I learned from the dossier, and you might have learned from Glubos, is a good example. She would be astonished. One day, I hope, will be, to learn that her whole life is enslaved to this kind of sensuality. In other words, I've got a trap by gluttony. But she'll be shocked because it's quite concealed from her by the fact that the quantities involved are small. But what do quantities matter, provided we can use a human belly and palate to produce querulousness, uh, that word means full of complaints, impatience, uncharitableness, and self-concern? Ho, 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 Glubos has this old woman well in hand. She is a positive terror to hostess. Hostesses and servants. She is always turning from what has been offered her to say with a demure little sigh and a smile, Oh, oh please, please, please. Oh, all I want is a cup of tea, weak, but not too weak, and the teensiest, weensiest bit of really crisp toast. You see, because what she wants is smaller and less costly than what's been set before her, she never recognizes as gluttony her determination to get what she wants, however troublesome it may be to others. So at the very moment of indulging her appetite, she believes she's practicing temperance. That word means self-control. So in a crowded restaurant, she gives a little scream at the plate, which some overworked waitress has set before her and says, oh, that, that's far, far too much. Take it away. Bring me about a quarter of it. Now, if challenged, she would say she was doing this to avoid waste. In reality, she does it because the particular shade of delicacy to which we have enslaved her is offended by the sight of more food than she happens to want. Okay, let's pause there. Can anybody picture this? Is anyone imagining a person right now? <laughs> Not themselves, of course, someone else. Right. Just a terror, you're embarrassed to go into the restaurant with them because you don't know what they're going to say to the waiter or the hostess. But seriously, Lewis is saying this, this, this gluttony of delicacy, this is the modern version of gluttony. He says the old version, what most people think of, is eating so much that you harm your own health and you don't share with others because you take it all for yourself. And why would you do that? Why would you eat it all for yourself? Because you're a slave to your appetite. Now... It's being so picky that you don't care how much you harm others just to get what you want exactly. Why? This was because you're a slave to your appetite. Screwtape says, why is it here? Same reason. You're still a slave to your appetite. That's what Screwtape's trying to drive home. Uh, he, he, he's saying either way, this is still, you're being controlled by belly and palate. Now Satan wants to take it even further. The next step in gluttony is to have her appetites dominate her whole life. Look, the real value of the quiet, unobtrusive work which Glubos has been doing for years on this old woman. Pause. Not the point, but wow. Think about that. 
the demonic work that's quiet, unobtrusive, and been doing it for years. <laughs> what does that say about the, the, uh, the diabolical workings? Quiet, unobtrusive, which has been doing it for years on this woman, can be gauged by the way in which her belly now dominates her whole life. The woman is in what may be called the all I want uh, state of mind. See, all she wants is a cup of tea properly made, or an egg properly boiled, or a slice of bed, bread properly toasted. Is that too much to ask? I don't think that's too much to ask. Right? But she never fails to find any servant or any friend who can do these simple things properly. You see that? She goes on sinning, but she covers it up with the, all I want. Is it too much to ask things done properly? And the obvious answer is, in your case, yes, it is too much to ask because of what you mean by properly. It helps, I don't know if it helps you. It helps me, when I think about this lady, to picture the old lady from Downton Abbey. I don't know if that helps anybody. I don't even know if it's an accurate character reference. I, she was probably really a nice person. But it, it, I just see this like, what? Is that so wrong? All I want. Well, Lewis goes on to describe why that's, why that's such a problem in a really long and complex sentence. But here's what he's saying. Yeah, it's wrong. Because your, prop, your quote unquote properly is an impossible standard. And you don't even know where that standard came from. You think you do, but you don't. Watch what Screwtape says. He does a little uh, analysis here. Because her quote properly conceals an insatiable, that word means it can never be satisfied, an insatiable demand for the exact and almost impossible palatal pleasures which she imagines she remembers from the past. A past described as her as you know, the days when you could get good sevens, but known to us as the days when her senses were more easily pleased and she had pleasures of other kinds which made her less dependent on those at the table. In other words, she's one of these that's always talking about, you know, back in my day, back in the day, things were better. And, and Screwtape's saying, no, they weren't. You're just, A, you weren't so picky back then, and B, you actually had a life. Right? You concerned yourself. You had other things going on, and so you weren't so concerned about, you know, uh, uh, everything. You know, but when all you care about is your, your meals, you don't know, have anything else going on, you get really, uh, you know, uppity about all this stuff. Meanwhile... Screwtape goes on. Here's, think about all that this does. Think about all the people she's hurting. And she doesn't think she's doing anything wrong. She's completely self-referential. She's, she's completely blind to all this. Meanwhile, the daily disappointment produces daily ill temper. Cooks give their two-week notice. And friendships are cooled. If ever the enemy introduces into her mind, you know, a faint suspicion that maybe she's too interested in food, glu glucose counters it by suggesting to her that she doesn't mind what she eats herself, but she does like to have nice things for her boy. Mm. In fact, of course, her greed's been one of the chief sources of his domestic, domestic discomfort for many years. Now, I just want to briefly touch on that line. What? It's not for me. It's for my kid. <clears throat> it's not about me. I, I, it's, it's for my child. May I add? Have you noticed people will excuse all kinds of wicked behavior when they play the, well, it's not about me, I'm just looking out for my family card. I'm just looking out for my kid. Not in every case, but perhaps in your line of work. And here I'm thinking about how many people in this room are teachers, coaches that maybe will know what I'm talking about. When people become real, parents become really mean, but then they go home and pat themselves on the back because I'm just a concerned parent who has a right to fight for my kid. When in fact you're just being mean. So they excuse themselves because what they're really doing is fighting for themselves because the kid has become an idol or worse, a projection of themselves in some unhealthy way. And the irony, so they, my point is, we will justify mean behavior because, well, it's, of course it's not about me. You know, I would never be this uh, uh, wicked and cruel and claws out, you know, but of course I'm just, you know, looking out for my family. I gotta do what's best for my family. So they're justifying mean behavior, and the irony is, this is all happening at the restaurant, and she says she's doing it for the kid, the, the young man, the patient, and the young man is what? He's mortified. He's not proud of this. He's not grateful for this. He's embarrassed by her. Anyway, back to how we can use, from Screwtape's perspective, he's thinking, how can we use gluttony as a temptation for the guy? Because so far we've been talking about uh, 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 the patient's mother, but that's glucose's concern. Let's get back to our patient. 
Well, the apple doesn't far from, fall far from the tree. Look what he says. Now your patient is his mother's son. So while working your hardest, quite rightly, on other fronts, in other words, I get it. You want to trap him in, in, in lust and immorality and pride. I get it. Don't neglect a little quiet infiltration in respect of gluttony. Now, being a male, he's not so likely to be caught by this all I want camouflage. No, males are best turned into gluttons with the help of their vanity. They ought to be made to think themselves very knowing about food, to pique themselves, that word means pride themselves, on having found the only restaurant in the town where the steaks are properly cooked. There's that word again, properly. Uh, you know, um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it does seem to me there is, <clears throat> there does seem to be a lot of posturing and when you, if you see a group of men in the wild, <laughs> and you study, you know, like a nature show, and they're at a barbecue, uh, they're all standing around watching somebody grill, just tell me if it's not true, there, there, do, there can be just a little bit of pride and vanity about their grilling techniques and their barbecue techniques, and it's not before long somebody brings, well, I got this big green smoker 3000, and uh, to me that's the only way you can make a steak. I don't know, you can eat this trash, but uh, you know, the only way to really smoke that, you know, it's like, okay, okay, uh, you know, it's always like, well, anyway. I guess I started the whole thing with, you know, I went to Kansas City and ain't burn in. <laughs> Screw tape's been working on me, I guess. Well, well, here, here's the value of that. So that, you might say, okay, that's harmless. That's just, that's just competitive vanity and a little bit of pride. Ah, what, what, watch what he says. What begins as vanity can then be gradually turned into habit. But however you approach it, the great thing is to bring him into the state in which the denial of any one indulgence, it matters not which, champagne or tea or soul colbert or cigarettes puts him out. For then... His charity, justice, and obedience are all at your mercy. The point is, get into the state where he's governed by his appetites. Now, either way, he would say, okay, so delicacy, so there's gluttony of excess, then the gluttony of delicacy, which he further divides into, typically, um, with, with the case of like his mom, it's going to be the, um, what did he call it, the all I want syndrome. And with him, it's going to be the um, uh, vanity, you know, well, the actual, you know, best way to do it, or I know the best. So if I can't get this particular thing I like, either way, it's all under the same heading, governed by appetite. Let me, uh, let me pause here just in case you've been listening to this whole thing and you're like, okay, I hear what Screwtape's saying. He's trying to attempt by means of uh, delicacy. And uh, the gluttony of vanity, okay. But what if you're like, I'm pretty sure he doesn't have to be that subtle for me. We have been the, um, uh, uh, while I appreciate all this subtlety, I'm pretty sure I just eat too much. <laughs> and if you're sitting here going, well, that, that, I don't need a lot of subtlety. It's just a temptation for me. What about mere excess? Well, he addresses that in his final paragraph. Mere excess in food is much less valuable than delicacy. It's cheap use. Now, that, that, that's interesting. For a young man, young single guy, he says, its chief use is a kind of artillery preparation for attacks on chastity. Ah, interesting. Chastity is an old-fashioned word that means sexual abstinence. He's saying, you got a young single guy here. Why would, why would gluttony, or the gluttony of excess, be a way of sort of lobbing some um, artillery attack? You know, if you want to soften up the enemy's defense, you, and, 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 of course, this is happening during World War II. The, this is imagined during World War II. And so the idea of artillery shells softening up an enemy's position, it doesn't mean you're going to wipe them out, but you're softening up for the, for the real attack. He says, use gluttony as a way to soften up your attacks on his sexual purity. Here's why. He says, look, you got a young single guy here. Get him in the habit of never being able to say no to one appetite, and you'll find he'll be less able to say no to another appetite. Isn't that interesting? He says, use this. Get him in the habit of not being able to say no. Self-control, he says, is self-control. And so when you're ready to attack another appetite, that of his sexual lust, he'll be less able to resist your temptations. So here he continues. On that, as on every other subject, keep your man in a condition of false spirituality. Never let him notice the medical aspect. In other words, never let him see that connection between what his body does and what his spirit does. 
keep him wondering what, what pride or lack of faith has delivered him into your hands when a simple inquiry into what he's been eating and drinking for the last 24 hours would show him which your ammunition comes and thus enable him by a very little abstinence to imperil your lines of communication. In other words, don't ever let him figure this out because if he figures this out, he might just say, oh wait, well then maybe if I slow down a little on this appetite, maybe if I make the connection and I slow down and I don't, I don't feed every impulse I have, huh, then maybe that'll work in other areas of temptation. And suddenly, with, as he says, a very little abstinence, suddenly, screw tape and wormwood are no longer able to make that temptation. So never let him see, in other words, he's saying, never let him see that bodies and souls are connected. Make him think all his sins and struggles are always completely spiritual. You know, I wonder if we, we do the same thing. When I was in college, I, uh, I, I was reading this book, and um, like, like, I guess like a lot of Christians, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but many Christians, um, y y you sort of have to, if, if, you, if you're like me and you grew up in the church, there has to be this point where it's like, okay, this was the faith that my parents had. I'm in my parents' church. That's great. But then when, at some point, it's like, is this going to be my faith? Like, am I going to really own this? And uh, for me, college was a time where I was like, wow, like, this is, this is real. Jesus is real. I have a relationship with him. I don't know if I'm doing a good job of explaining it, but there was just something that really, uh, I felt like these lights kept, kept turning on and I, um, so much growth. And one was, uh, by a book, uh, was a book about spiritual disciplines um, by a guy named John Ortberg. And it's an old book. It probably came out in um, ooh, maybe late 90s. But it's called The Life You've Always Wanted, Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People. I love that title. And what he did is he read Dallas Willard and Richard Foster and all these spiritual disciplines authors. And, and to use John Ortberg's own language, he tried to put the cookies on the low shelf. You know, he tried to take these brilliant writers and make it accessible for everybody. And uh, I think it was in that book. Here, I've done this great job of setting this thing up. And I can't remember if this is where the quote comes from. So I'm, I'm crediting John Warburg. But if somebody watches this video and finds out uh, it was somebody else, I guess, you know, send me an email. Well, if you're watching the video, you can tell me in the comments that, uh, where this comes from. But I think Warburg says in that book, the most spiritual thing you could do right now. Talking about loving God, loving people. Of course, now that I say that, it may have been in his next book, Love Beyond Reason. It, it doesn't matter. The point is... <laughs> He says the most spiritual thing you could do right now, and I'm thinking pray for an hour, fast for a week, the most spiritual thing you could do right now to help you love God and love people is put this book down right now and go take a nap. His point was, it might be that you're not able to love God and love people because you've got some spiritual pride going on. You, okay. It could be you're just grumpy. Right? It could be you need to take a nap. Maybe eat a salad. Like, you don't, maybe you don't need a four-hour sermon lecture as the, your next step of spiritual discipline. Maybe take care of your physical health in such a way so that you can love others better. We don't take care of our physical health. Why, what is the point of physical health? What is the point of exercise? Um, is it not? What, what's the point of a human being? To love God and to love other people. To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. To, to see a human being on fire with the, for the glory of God. It's, it's not to, not to, you know, Rick Warren says you can perfect your body, you can neglect your body, or you can respect your body. And it, it, it's meant to glorify God. Um, uh, so anyway, controlling these appetites are, are a means um, to do that. Screwtape never, said, Screwtape never wants you to make that connection. He wants you to think that uh, nothing physical, you know, has nothing to do with it. So why did I, I said all that? That to me... All this makes a great case for the spiritual discipline of fasting. There, the Bible gives many reasons for fasting. And by fasting, I mean denying one's appetite for food for a, a set period of time. Not eating food for a set period of time. To which some of you are know, like, I, I do that every night. Every night I go to bed, and I fast the whole night. And when I wake up in the morning, I break the fast at a meal I call break fast. And so I'm already doing it. Check. That, that, that's great. Um, but what you're trying to do is have self-control. And when you fast, among many other things you're doing, I don't want to say this is the only point of fasting, but one of the things fasting does, and those of you who have um, um, uh, experienced and, and, and tried on that, that spiritual discipline of fasting, one of the things you'll notice is you realize how governed you are by that appetite, and you realize how governed you are by many appetites. And it's a way of saying, wait a minute. You don't, hey, Belly, I hear you growling for lunch. Yes, I hear you. Yes, yes, I know. 
I know we just had second breakfast and elevensies, and now you're ready for lunch. <laughs> but uh, no. And your belly says, what? That's right. No. But I control you. No, appetite. I control you. Because I am controlled by the Holy Spirit. So I, therefore, have a fruit of the Spirit. Part of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And it's a way of telling that appetite, no. Your appetite doesn't like that, but it goes, okay. Then you're the boss. That's right. And somehow, fasting becomes training, not only to say no to that appetite, but all sorts of appetites. Greed, lust, avarice. So if he must think of the medical side of chastity, so now he's back, and this is kind of, I don't know if this is like a 1940s thing. If he must think of the medical side of chastity, feed him on the grand lie which we've made the English humans believe, that physical exercise in excess and consequent fatigue are specially favorable to this virtue. Now what's he talking about? Is CrossFit satanic? <laughs> Leave a comment in the comment section. <laughs> what's he talking about? Apparently, uh, there's an old lie going around that young men won't be tempted sexually if they're constantly exhausted from exercise, so have them involved in all these sports. He writes, how they can believe this in the, face of no the, in face of the notorious lustfulness of sailors and soldiers may well be asked. <laughs> but we use the schoolmasters to put the story about men who were really interested in chastity as an excuse for games and therefore recommended games as an aid to chastity. Complex sentence. I don't, it's, it's not the main point. Uh, but Lewis is saying, obviously, excessive exercise is not proof that you won't struggle with sexual purity. And think about the notorious reputation of soldiers and sailors back in the day. So how did it come about? Well, back in the day in England, if you can imagine England in the 1920s and 30s, you got headmasters of private Christian schools. These are all boys' schools. They were usually run by a church. So the, the headmasters of these schools really just wanted more time for sports. But the church wouldn't allow more time for sports. So to justify it, they went and told the church uh, priests and stuff that, well, sports are an effective aid in keeping boys pure. And so they didn't really care about the spiritual condition of the, of the boys. They cared about sports. So that's what he means by they, they, used, the, they used that excuse, which was really just uh, uh, they cared about sports. Anyway, that's what he's talking about there. But he says this whole business is too large to deal with at the tail end of a letter. And so he's going to deal with it more in upcoming letters. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. All right. I would like to press on and then see if just maybe today's the day we can allow uh, some time uh, for Q&A. So he's going to deal with that next topic of sexual purity in the next letter to which we now turn. So if you guys will turn now to letter 18, the topic of sex and really marriage. Um, we'll try to uh, get through this one and then see if we have some time left. Jump right in. My dear Wormwood, even under slub gob, you must, he's always taking shots at this slub gob. He's apparently the training of whatever the demon seminary is, the under college. Uh, even under slub gob, you must have learned at college the routine technique of sexual temptation. And since for us spirits, the whole subject is one of considerable tedium. Though necessary as part of our training, I will pass it over. But on the larger issues involved, I think you have a good deal to learn. Uh, you would think, I just, I'll just pause there and make this kind of side comment. You would think that the topic of sexual impurity would be like a hot topic. Oh man, sexual morality, you know, that's, that's, that's juicy stuff, that's a hot topic. I think it is interesting that from the demon's perspective, it's like, ugh, boring. Because all sin, ultimately, really is boring. There's no creativity in hell. Remember, they can't create. Only God can create. So what can Satan do? All he can do, since he can't create sin, all he can do is take a good gift of God and twist or pervert. That's all he can do. He can lie, he can twist, he can pervert, but he can't create sin. So when it comes to food, he can pervert God's good gift of food. Who can deny that food is a good gift? You know, God could have made us in such a way. Like, why did God make taste buds? Right? He could have just made us in such a way that we just picked a certain pill off a certain tree of nutrients and popped it in, and that gave us our nutrition for the month or something. Instead, he let us taste things like burnt ends from Kansas City. <laughs> things that were cooked on the smoke pit 3000, you know. 
Um, he didn't have to do that. So who can deny that food is a good gift? So what does Satan do? He can't create unfood. I mean, if you think, I, I, I'm pretty sure when I was first learning to cook, I created satanic unfood. <laughs> you didn't, okay? You didn't. You may have messed up. But, but he can't create unfood. He can't create, you know, so what can he do? He takes God good gift of food and perverts it into, on the one hand, uh, an eating disorder, right? A gluttony, or on the other hand, anorexia or bulimia or something. He's taking God's good gift of food and twisted it. Uh, the same thing with sex. He's taking God's good gift and twisted it. And so that, 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 for him, this, this is boring. There's no creativity. But he does want to speak to some larger issues. And so really this letter is, is, is it's, a, it's about sex, but it's really about marriage. And it's a lot like C.S. Lewis. I'll just say this about this letter. This is a difficult letter. It, not because of the topic. It, it's just thick. It's dense. It's, it's philosophical. But it's worth it. So, so let this like be a lesson to all of us. Um, it is fun to read books that are beneath us. I, I don't mean that in a prideful way. I mean, intellectually, they don't challenge you at all. They're fun to read. I read them at night before bed because you don't have to do any thinking about it. And right, it's great. So I love books where you know the good guy goes in, he blows everything up, and you know there's 30 bad guys armed to the teeth, and one guy walks in. I'm like, I know who's going to win every time. Yeah, you know, fine. Then there's books to read that are at your level. But we also need to read books that are above us. They're difficult. We're not going to get everything because then we can pull ourselves up. So it's good to have a steady diet of all of those things. To me, this chapter is an example where Lewis is he's above me. He's above where I'm at. But I need to read that. I need to be stimulated in that way so that I can, I can grow and I can learn. So don't ever be discouraged when you read a passage you don't understand. That, that's good. That means you, you're going to learn. Also, that, that's... For those, you know, some people, they grew up in church and everything that's said every Sunday, they have a category for it. It makes sense. But there's going to be times when you're in a sermon and you're like, I didn't, I didn't get like, whoo, I didn't get like, whoo, I didn't get like 50% of that. And that's being generous. Other times you're like, I didn't get 7% of that. And to kids, I tell kids, you know, whether you're in first kids worship or, or you're sitting in big church, or we used to call it big church, I don't know. Um, and you think, man, I'm getting maybe 7% of this. Hey, I can tell you, as somebody who grew up, with, there was no kids' church. There was slaps on the back of the head. <laughs> and I heard Alistair Begg say this. He grew up apparently in a similar environment. But I'll tell you this. Um, I probably got about 7% of everything that happened in a worship service as a kid. And then 7% the next week. But here's what I, here's what I can tell you. Those 7% add up. So even, a, even, even if you say, I'm just getting a little bit, I'm getting a little nugget from this. That stuff adds up. So I, I guess that's my like speech. Don't get discouraged. Lewis is hard because you have to mine and dig for the treasures. But the treasures you have to mine and dig for are often the most valuable. So I'm proud of you guys. Keep, up, keep it up. And by the way, after next week, we are over two-thirds of the way done. So it's like the home stretch here. And we even get like spring break off. We got this! Okay, all right, here we go. As a pep talk for me. <laughs> the enemy's demand. Here we go. This is what I want you to get. This is the 7% right here. The enemy's demand on humans takes the form of a dilemma. Either complete abstinence or unmitigated monogamy. Unmitigated means unlessened. 100%. 100%. That right there. God's sexual ethic. So good, guys. Here it is. I use this all the time. I tell people this. This has become my go-to. Sexual ethic is very, very hot topic right now, culturally across the board. Here, they say, what do you believe, Tom? God's sexual ethic, there are two things that put you in, in bounds of God's sexual ethic. Everything is out of bounds. Number one, complete abstinence in singleness. The old-fashioned word was chastity, but whatever word you like. Complete purity and singleness. I know purity has got the... It went, purity had, had a weird time for a while. I don't remember all the issues involved in that, but whatever. Complete abstinence and singleness. That's my... Uh, as language change, you'll, you'll see. Whatever word you got to use. But the point is, complete purity, complete chastity and singleness. Complete faithfulness in marriage. 
And if somebody uh, needs me to clarify, I can clarify. I define marriage as between a man and a woman in a lifelong covenant commitment. So, but most people, if they know wh where I'm going with this anyway, they, they understand that that's what I'm using. That's it. Okay, there you go. There's God. There, there it is. There's the sexual ethic. Complete singleness, co complete abstinence when you're single, completely faithful when you're married. Period. That's it. There's no third option. Anything outside of that puts you outside of the bounds of the biblical sexual ethic. Why do I love this framework? Why has this been so helpful for me in recent years? Several reasons. One, it's short enough you can remember it. So when you're talking to a youth group, you don't have to go into like some big 30-page you know, document about purity and about all this stuff. You say, hey guys, here's the rules. Completely pure when you're single, completely faithful when you're married. That's it. The other thing, it reminds you that um, I've drawn these lines. It helps you when you're in a conversation. Uh, it helps you, I think, culturally. This, this does a little bit of cultural apologetics. Because what it says when you're a Christian, you can say, um, as the topic comes up about uh, uh, LGBT issues or all these cultural hot topics, you can say, well, um, what I believe, so as a Christian, I come under the authority of Scripture. And in the authority of Scripture, the Bible uh, 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 proscribes complete absence when you're single, completely faithful when you're married. And that's it. That's where the Bible draws the lines. Here's why this is important. I'm not talking about everything I'm against. I'm talking about what I'm for. Okay. And what it reminds, what it, the next logical question is, here's where I draw the lines, and here's where I got them from. Where do you draw your lines? And where did you get them from? To which the answer is going to be, well, that's just it, man. I don't, I don't draw a bunch of lines. Love is love, and I don't have those. I, I think that's wrong. I'm like, oh, okay, well, what do you mean? Well, I think as long as it's consensual, I think, too. ah, so there's a line, consensual. Well, I guess, okay, that's a line. But I think if two people, there's another line. You've limited to two. That rules out polyamory. That rules out all sorts of things. My point is you have lines. Yeah, but they're broad. And there will always be someone who draws the lines even more broadly than you. What will you say to them with your narrow, narrow viewpoint? You don't have to be as sarcastic as I am, but, you, you know. You see my point? Get Everyone needs to admit we're all drawing lines about what is acceptable and what is not. The follow-up question is, I got my lines from a document that I believe is the Word of God, and <laughs> not for nothing, but if you draw your lines differently than this, you're running contrary to about two-thirds of the world's population. Every Jew, Muslim, and Christian on the planet is like, that, that, that's orthodox belief. In Judeo-Christian and Islam, that's what they're going to say. You, you with me so far? So, so, where did you get those, where did you get your lines? Well, if I had to admit, I would say, I guess I got them from my culture. Ultimately, I got them from me. Well, if you're, if I'm getting my lines on where I draw this stuff from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you're getting them from your bowling team, like, I'll take my chances with the Bible, right? Many people want to approach the topic of uh, sexuality in our culture as if the Bible is a bunch of thou shalt nots. You know, what's the Bible against? And I think that can lead to misunderstanding. At best, at worst, people use it as a deliberate trap because it's too broad a question. I think it's better to start the conversation. Here's what the Bible's for. And this is what we believe. And if you really can't think of anything I've just said and you're like, uh, my pastor talked about what this is and our sexual ethic, I think complete absence and singleness, complete faithfulness in marriage, and then you can just say, you know, you pull out a Bible and say, I, I, I don't get to make the rules, you know. I believe what the Bible says. You don't have to be defensive. You don't, certainly don't have to be aggressive. And you don't have to make the rules. You just get to bear faithful witness. I spent a long time on that because here's why. If you get nothing else out of this chapter, this I hope will help you. Okay? That's it. To me, putting it that simply and plainly is helpful. The rest of this chapter is very, very valuable, uh, but it's going to take work. So here's what he says. He's speaking to larger issues involved around this. Can you see where he says, ever since? Ever since our fathers? You see that? Ever since our fathers' first great victory, that's what he calls the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. We have rendered the former, complete absence and singleness, very difficult to them. And the latter, complete faithfulness in marriage, we've been closing up as a way of escape. We've done this through the poets and novelists by persuading the humans that a curious, 
and usually short-lived experience, which they call, quote, being in love, is the only respectable ground for marriage, that marriage can and ought to render this excitement permanent, and that a marriage which does not do so is no longer binding. <laughs> this idea is our parody of an idea that actually came from the enemy. Brilliant. Let's pause. Screw tape is saying, try to tempt the humans to forget or ignore or change what the purpose and definition of marriage really is. And, and, and once again, I know I've pointed this out before, but he wrote it in 1941. And the fact that he's, he's saying in 1941, Lewis is saying, get the humans to think that the definition of marriage, the purpose of marriage, and the foundational basis of marriage is being in love. Let me say that again. In 1941, he was able to say a satanic attack would be to get humans to have the word marriage be completely up for grabs in how you define it, but make being in love the uh, uh, purpose and the foundation of it. Why? And, and, and go a step further. If that feeling ever fades, the marriage is no longer binding. He fell in love, whatever. I would say, here we are in 2023, and the purpose of marriage would probably be connected to what everything in the secular world is connected with, and that's the purpose of everything, the fulfillment of self. I think that's what most people would say today, outside of Christianity, they would say, um, well, the purpose of marriage is fulfillment of self, right, in, in some sense. But either way, uh, my own definition of marriage, I would use Tim and Kathy Keller's in their book, The Meaning of Marriage. I'll give you a definition and purpose. Uh, the definition of marriage, lifelong monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. Purpose, uh, according to the Bible, God devised marriage for three things. Number one, reflect his saving love for us in Christ, right? It's to show forth the gospel. That's another sermon for another time. But reflect his saving love for us in Christ. For those of you who were in the um, marriage group uh, last semester, I hope this, some of this sounds remotely familiar. Maybe it's part of the 7%. Two, to refine our character. God gave us marriage not just to make us happy, but to make us holy. right? And three, to create stable human community for the birth and nurture of children. If God gives a couple the gift of children, then it will create a stable human community for their flourishing. And to accomplish all this by bringing the complementary sexes into an enduring whole life union. And that's a quote from uh, Tim and Kathy Keller's book, Meaning of Marriage. So with that definition in mind, let's see if we can figure out what Screwtape's up to in his attempt to sabotage marriages. Here we go. This is thick stuff. The whole philosophy of hell. You see where I'm at? The whole philosophy of hell rests on recognition of the axiom that one thing is not another thing. And specifically, one self is not another self. See, my good is my good and your good is yours. What one gains another loses. Even an inanimate object is what it is by excluding all other objects from the space it occupies. If it expands, it does so by thrusting other objects aside or by absorbing them. A self does the same. With beasts, the absorption takes the form of eating. For us, meaning us demons who are spirit creatures, it means the sucking of will and freedom out of a weaker self into a stronger. To be means to be in competition. Um, my kids uh, had, had, they had this game, this little app, and it was these uh, snakes that were like floating around in space, I guess. It was the weirdest app. And I said, what are you doing? And they would guide these snakes. And it was very simple. Um, if, uh, if, if a snake ran into, see, like if, if a snake ran into your snake, it like, poof, like disappeared, and you would like gobble up its pieces, and your snake would get bigger. And, and the bigger the snake got, the more dangerous it was because it was like it was like the strong devour the weak. I'm sitting there playing it like this is oddly really disturbing because it was so like Darwinian. It was like 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 uh, survival of the fittest. And I thought this is kind of creeping me out. And the way you got bigger and got more points was like gobbling up the weaker snakes or whatever. And I was like, uh, I don't, uh, you know, for being rated E for everyone, this game creeps me out a lot. Uh, Anyway, I may be the only one who thinks that, but like, here's this doctrine of hell that like the strong devours the weak. It's a zero-sum game. For me to win, you must lose. I used this illustration before, but in Screwtape's world, the apple and I can be united, but the apple's going to change. I'm going to eat the apple and process it and consume it. That's the only, like, like the apple and I can be united, but that is, a, that is hell's version of unity. It's been devoured. 
Now the enemy's philosophy, he's saying that's the problem with God. Watch. Now the enemy's philosophy is nothing more or less than one continued attempt to evade this very obvious truth. He aims at a contradiction. Things are to be many, yet somehow also one. Ugh. The good of oneself is to be the good of another. Ugh. This impossibility he calls love. And this same monotonous panacea, that word means a cure-all, can be detected under all he does and even all he is. Oh, or claims to be. Good cover, screw tape. You almost slipped into heresy. Did you hear that? He almost said God is love. Whoops. I mean, that's what he claims to be. Thus, what's he talking about here? How can, th how can three be one? Or It doesn't make sense. Thus, he is not content, even himself, to be a sheer arithmetical unity. He claims to be three as well as one. In other words, he, he himself claims to be triune in order that this nonsense about love may find a foothold in his own nature. Ugh. At the other end of the scale, he introduces into matter that obscene invention, the organism, in which the parts are perverted from their natural destiny of competition and made to cooperate. Thick stuff. I can break it down for you. In other words, he's saying in, in his own nature, he's triune. Three in one. So that means God existed before there was time, before there was universe. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons for all eternity, which means... The, the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves the Father. And they are engaged in eternal... There's love. That's why the Bible can say in 1 John, God is love. Because love needs an object. That is an objection, by the way. Against. That's part of why I am not a Muslim. Uh, who would say, that, that, that's blasphemy to a Muslim, right? Allah is one. And the whole idea of a trinity is, is, is blasphemous in the Muslim of theology. But that's my point. That means at the very core of the Muslim universe, you might say God is power, but you could never say God is love. Uh, God didn't have to create. It also meant God wasn't lonely. It meant the only reason you're here. Did you think about that? God doesn't need a universe to sing his praises. God is eternally happy. He's the eternally blessed God, he, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So he has to, the very act of grace to create a universe and then to populate it with humans. That means that every single one of you, you were not created because God needs you to glorify him. He's not uh, insecure and thinks I'm going to make some humans so they can send me glory. No, the only reason you're here is an overflow of his love. And then he wants to do that in everything. Think about your organs, Screwtape says. Think about that for a second. Your organs, you, you would think your liver would be like, I don't care if brain has to shut down. Liver's in it for liver. And liver's going to go on living and be strong. I don't care what happens to brain. Or fingers start to get cold and be like, I don't care if toes die of frostbite. It's fingers, right? Fingers are for fingers, and we're going to take all the blood and the oxygen and the warmth. I don't care what other parts. Instead, do you know your body? Your, the parts of your body, your organs, they work together instead as an organism. Many functioning as one. Screwtape says it's obscene. So his real motive for fixing on sex as the method of reproduction among humans is only too apparent from the use he's made of it. Sex might have been, from our point of view, quite innocent. It might have been merely one more mode in which a stronger self preyed upon a weaker, as it is indeed among the spiders where the bride concludes her nuptials by eating her groom. What is that, the, the black widow or the one of, one of those spiders? Yeah. But in the humans, the enemy has gratuitously, that word means needlessly, associated affection between the parties with sexual desire. He's also made the offspring dependent on the parents and given the parents an impulse to support it. Now, most of the days, those of you with new children, you have an impulse to support your baby, except at like 3 in the morning when it's crying. But, but most of the time... <laughs> thus producing... Yeah, you must love the child, right? Thus producing the family, which is like the organism, only worse, for the members are more distinct, yet also united in a more conscious and responsible way. The whole thing, in fact, turns out to be simply one more device for dragging in love. What's Screwtape saying? God designed the physical act of sex to be contained within the confines of covenant marriage, in part because it produces so much affection, and that love and affection can be in the environment for raising a family. Let's continue. Now comes the joke. The enemy described a married couple as, quote, one flesh. He did not say, quote, a happily married couple or, quote, a couple who married because they were in love. But you can make the humans ignore that. You can also make them forget that the man they call Paul did not confine it to married couples. Mere copulation for him makes one flesh. 
You can thus get the humans to accept as rhetorical eulogies, that means high praise, of, quote, being in love, what were in fact plain descriptions of the real significance of sexual intercourse. The truth is that wherever a man lies with a woman, there, whether they like it or not, a transcendental relation is set up between them, which must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. Transcendental just means relating to the spiritual or non-physical realm. Lewis is teaching us several things here. It'll pay us uh, great dividends, I think, if you, to go back and, and reread this. We may not get it all in the first pass. But like it or not, the uh, first thing he's trying to say is there is not, no matter what you've heard, no matter what you see in media or TV or movies, the truth is there has never been and there never will be such a thing as a harmless little fling. There's no such thing as a casual sexual encounter. That's an invention of the enemy. Sex is a powerful force. Why? Because it was designed to be powerful. Because it, why? It was designed to cement couples who are married into deeper and deeper bonds of affection for one another. So, and you can ask yourself, does a life, people would say, people would push back on that and say, no, I, come on, let's be progressive. It's a modern age. You know, uh, 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 didn't we have a sexual revolution in the 60s? Doesn't that cause human flourishing? Um, ask. Has that left us better and more flourishing as humans? Or has sex outside of marriage left a trail of brokenness, and broken hearts along the way? Lewis says, Lewis is saying, Satan's trying to get sexual attraction to be called being in love. And once he does that, watch how he twists things. Let me say this sentence. God says, commit to one another in marriage, do it God's way. Then over time, through intimacy and commitment, affection grows. Satan wants you to do it the other way around. He wants you to try, he wants couples to muster up intimacy and affection and then and only then enter into marriage. Everybody see the reversal? Here, here in Screwtape's own words, from the true statement that this transcendental relation, in other words, that sex was intended to produce, and if obediently entered into, too often will produce affection in the family, humans can be made to infer the false belief that the blend of affection, fear, and desire, which they call being in love, in other words, sexual attraction, is the only thing that makes marriage either happy or holy. I'm going to read my sentence again, then I won't belabor the point, I'll move on. But God says, commit to one another in marriage, do it God's way. And over time, through intimacy and commitment, affection grows. Satan wants you to do it the other way around. Muster up intimacy and affection, and then and only then enter into marriage. You see the reversal. Screwtape writes, the error is easy to produce because, I mean, being in love does very often in Western Europe precede marriages. I don't know about you, but that happened to me. I didn't mean to before I got married, but I fell in love. Maybe you did too. In other words, he's saying it's not wrong to have feelings of affection. Of course. He's saying that's not. But watch. Yes, it'll precede marriages which are made in obedience to the enemy's designs. That is, with the intention of fidelity, fertility, and goodwill. Just as religious emotion very often, but not always, attends conversion. In other words, yeah. And, and also, there are people who feel all these things before they get saved. They feel all this. But that's not the basis of salvation. Just like being in love is not the basis. It's not wrong to be attracted to someone and fall in love with them and then marry them. But if you make those warm, fuzzy feelings the only foundation for marriage, marriage can't be built on that alone as a foundation. That's what he's saying right here. In other words, the humans are encouraged to regard as the basis for marriage a highly colored and distorted version of something the enemy really promises as a result. Screwtape wants to water down marriage to just being in love and make that the only basis for marrying. Oh, and by the way, it's the only basis for staying married in Screwtape's mind. If you ever stop having feelings of love, you can just end the marriage. Here's the irony. The truth is, couples who stick it out, couples that stay married for the long haul, guess what often happens? They fall deeper in love. They grow in affection. So, so watch this. By not building on, let me whiteboard this. Oh, but that's so good, I want to leave that up there. Okay, let's do two foundations for a marriage. This one's no good. It's, it's, it's bad. This one's strong, okay? This is being, whoops, being in love. This is commitment. Commitment. I don't know how many T's, but there's a bunch. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. So, so by building on the foundation of being in love, it's, it's not, I can't sustain a marriage. But by saying, what, the being in love part is not the point. The commitment's the part. Here's the irony is, you may just find out, you fall in love. 
So they, these, these couples, over the long haul, grow. It's almost like if you do it God's way, you might just get being in love thrown in. Well, what are the specific advantages from the devil's point of view for making the basis of marriage just being in love? There are two. Here they are. Two advantages follow. In the first place, humans who have not the gift of continence, uh, that word means self-restraint, uh, abstinence. In other words, God gives some people the gift of singleness. They're to remain chaste their whole life. Think of the Apostle Paul, for example. Uh, if humans are not given that gift, then they can be deterred from seeking marriage as a solution because they do not find themselves in love. And thanks to us, the idea of marrying with any other motive seems to them low and cynical. So th this is uh, in Scripture, in 1 Corinthians um, Chapter 7, it says, uh, look, if you've not been given the gift of singleness, I'm paraphrasing, it's like, uh, you know, go ahead and get, get married because it's better to marry than to, burn for, than to burn with passion, better to marry than to burn with lust. But we think that's beneath us as a motive. And let me just ask you straight up, can you imagine in 2023, if you ask somebody, hey, man, what, how are you getting married? Why are you getting married? Honestly, uh, it's that or burn. Um, so, yeah. Oh. Uh. Yeah, I'll go to this church, and the pastor told me there's only two choices. <laughs> and when I read that those were my only two lanes, I said, well, I'm going to get in this one. And uh, that saved me from sinning. Your laughter gives us all away. I would laugh too. Why? Well, that's no reason. The Bible would say, and why not? Why not? If someone was so serious about avoiding sin, why would that not be? A reason. Take it a step further. If someone says, well, why are you getting married? Mutual partnership. So I don't burn with lust. To have an environment that if God blesses with kids to raise kids. They say, no, no, no. It's okay. If that's not a good reason, what is a good reason? You must be filled with emotion that feels sort of like the flu. <laughs> be in love. Right? And maybe being in love didn't feel like the flu to you. But you get my point, right? How is that a better? Let me see. Like what? When you when you really boil it down, you tell me what is a better motivation. So screw tape is like, listen, humans do human do humans really think that marrying for any other reason than being head over heels in love is beneath them? Yes, they think that. Everybody see where I am? Yes, they totally think that. They regard the intention of loyalty to a partnership for mutual help, for the preservation of chastity, and for the transmission of life. As something lower than a storm of emotion. And don't neglect to make your man think the marriage service very offensive. In other words, yes, humans would be embarrassed if they said, the main reason I'm getting married is I need a partner for mutual help. I need help preserving chastity and uh, the transmission of life. They'd say, what? No, no, no. A storm of emotion is a better reason to get married. Is it? Think about all those arranged marriages throughout the years. That they, get, they arranged because like, the, the people who knew them best met a family that, that, that believed in, and, and I, I, you know, isn't that something? Like, these cultures with arranged marriages, you, you let the people who know you best select for you a mate. And we're like, that's terrible. Well, how should you do it? Swipe right. And, really? Like, that's better. That's, that's really better? Okay. Now I'm preaching. I guess my point is, um, Jack and I have chosen... Uh, to arrange the marriages of all three of our children. <laughs> That's what we're trying to say. And so if, if you're here, if you're watching this online, if you've got uh, kids that are uh, about their age, uh, we're running a two-for-one dowry special. <laughs> and just, you know, see us after class. And, uh, just jokes, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so the screw tape is, uh, can you imagine somebody comes to date my kid? I'm like, turn with me to letter 18. Ah! I'm never coming back. Okay, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So screw tape's like, yeah, yeah, humans really think this. In the second place, remember, there's two advantages. The second advantage is any sexual infatuation, whatever, so long as it intends marriage, will be regarded as love, and love will be held to excuse a man from all the guilt and to protect him from all the consequences of marrying a heathen, a fool, or a wanton. Whew, crazy, difficult sentence in my opinion because screw tape uses such flowery language, which is so cool because it's satirical and it's the whole genre, but sometimes I just wish he would like speak in modern words. What he's saying is this. Once the man thinks I'm in love, which he really just means I'm physically attracted to a person, then he'll think it's okay to sleep with this person before marriage so long as I'm going to marry him. See, now there's no guilt since being in love is the whole point of the foundation. Or, on the other hand, I have to marry her even though they're a bad person and would make a bad mate because culture says you can only marry somebody that you're in love with, which again for him means uh, sexual attraction and infatuation. 
but more of this in my next. And so next week we'll try to cover 19, 20, and 21. This is a difficult letter, but I hope you'll keep the key um, takeaway, and I hope that it helps you in uh, both your own life and in cultural apologetics, really, and discussing with a world that I think is uh, maybe gone off the rails a little bit in this uh, in this topic.